Okay, I have just plugged in my new microphone. Is it working okay? Yes. We can it just means that I can't hear you. So if um, um, if you, uh, yeah, if, if anything happens with the audio, just let me know. Just wait. Perfect. So first of all, thank you so much. This is great. I loved getting an invitation to um, just talk about my background and my research in this kind of broad span. Um, and I also just really love the idea of the UCL Changemakers series, just the way to connect with academics and the fact that you guys have used it as a way not only to connect with your own academics, but others more broadly, um, and not just locally, although I'm happy to be local. Screening here from Queen's Park, Northwest London. Um, also, a bit of an apology. Uh, I um, had um, I haven't replied to your email have email about the introduction, and also I was preparing my slides as well, all set for this morning, and I'm afraid we had a medical emergency my children so um i everything is fine but i wasn't able to do slides and um, all i was going to do was a few illustrations anyway um, um i just made you co-host so you can just share your screen anyway and share the slides with us sorry um your co-host so you you can share your screen and you can control the chat so that's okay. easy as well if you want to show some slides okay i mean i decided against i wasn't able to i wasn't able to prepare them especially for this talk this morning so i think it's easier if i just give it an informal talk i had thought about cancelling but i didn't want to cancel on you guys so last minute so i hope it's okay that i just kind of give an informal talk okay. through um, some some of the things i care about okay so um Yes, so my name is Jennifer Sheehy Skeffington, and what I thought I would do now is um, just give you a little bit of a um, journey through um, how I came to um, what I'm doing right now, and in particular how that uh, helps understand some of the rationale uh, underlying why it is that I study what I do and the specific approach that I take to it. And the reason I think it's worth doing that is not because I think I'm particularly special or interesting. It's actually because I think that sometimes hearing these kind of stories about being dissatisfied with psychology and about thinking about how psychology might do a better job at things um, can inspire others, hopefully, to think outside of the current bounds of what our discipline is, is currently is. So I'm from Ireland and from a very young age, I always cared about the interface between individuals and society. It was, you know, what is poverty doing to people? And um, why do people believe politicians the way they do? And um, why do people um, vote in such strange ways? How do people treat each other in such nasty ways? These big questions about people, our minds, who we are, and the wider social context. So to study that, I thought, well, obviously, social psychology is the way to go. I did an undergraduate degree in Trinity in Dublin, um, where I did psychology and also with philosophy. And there, the most disappointing class was social psychology. And overall, the most disappointing part of my degree was, was the psychology part. Um, firstly, it was because um, although I was doing psychology and philosophy, there was very little interaction between the psychology side and the philosophy side. So it seemed that there was no philosophy of psychology. There was no kind of reflection of why is it that we do psychology the way we do. In fact, there seemed to be a very set story about why we do psychology the way we do. We do psychology because we are scientists and we must establish that we are scientists in everything we do. And so it's all about you know, the experimental method and, um, and in particular in social psychology that really, really needs to be pushed because social psychology can seem like it's a bit airy fairy, right? So we have to really push the scientific thing so that we establish our scientific credentials. And that was fine. I'm, I was fully on board with that. But studying it at the same time of philosophy kind of helped me realize the shortcomings there. Because, of course, if you want to study individuals in wider social context, individuals as citizens of a society, it's quite hard to do that experimentally. And it's quite hard to do that um, in a way that presumes that everything can be reduced to something that's easily measurable and quantifiable. So what I did um, next was I um, did, uh, I mean, after a, a break and travels, I went to, to the LSE um, because there I was told that social psychology was taught in a different way. So I was like, okay, maybe I can give social psychology another chance here. And maybe it can be more than just, I mean, what I found when you look at social psychology just experimentally in this quite individualistic way is that, I don't know, the kinds of things you can show with an experiment end up being quite trivial. You know, sometimes people work harder in the presence of others, but in other times they work less hard in the presence of others. We'll just name those two effects, um, a social loafing, social facilitation, and then we've, we've explained something. But that's not really explaining anything. And um, also that 
that the, the actual experience that I have of living in this wider social context doesn't seem to be captured by these kind of dry results um, that I was reading in these journal articles. What happened at the LSE then, and this was the LSE if you, uh, about a decade ago, was that there they said social psychology can be something completely different. Um, and it specifically shouldn't be the kind of experimental social psychology that is responsible for individualizing our discipline and making it less relevant to thinking about social issues of our day and thinking about the wider societal context. And they said, we do sociological social psychology. We do European social psychology. And that is in direct counterpoint to American social psychology. So here the caricature that's painted is that American social psychology is highly individualistic um, and because of its obsession with being a science, because of its physics envy, which apparently our whole discipline um, suffers from, what it ends up doing is only studying people as they are affected by very immediate social contexts. So how am I affected by how I perceive others or by interpersonal interactions with others? And the studies of attraction and even group dynamics are still quite local because they're the kinds of things you can get into a lab. But of course, um, sociality and the social context affects us in far broader ways. The critique there was that um, the problem with this is that you are not only empirically missing out on the impact of wider societal context on human behavior, but you're also ideologically fitting a kind of narrative that suits people in control of society, because what that does is it kind of lets society off the hook. And it makes it look like everything's just about what's going on in the local context and so therefore we can just intervene in the local context and this kind of might be reminiscent of some contemporary ways that psychology and behavioral science behavioral insights are being applied right now so if you think about the individual if you think about psychology therefore you need to always intervene at that level um, and so you can not worry about the wider social issues that's my uh, one-year-old trying to get into the room um, so that's so there are two uh, mistakes there then the empirical one um, and the ideological one and so the claim was that in order to really do this right you need to throw all of this out the window right you need to forget experimental methods they're individualizing they're reductive um, and they're kind of ideologically suspect and you also need to forget these theories that are based in the individual instead we need to think about the social self in the way that the social self was historically thought of um, at the very foundings of psychology. So even Wilhelm Wolft uh, in his Volker psychology really thought about the social self. But um, when Allport came along and really individualized things and said the group is nothing more than the sum of its individuals, that social side of social psychology got lost. And actually it kind of moved over to sociology. So something like symbolic interactionism and the work of Jerome Bruner and others, um, um, really uh, w was where some of this more interesting focus on the individual interfacing with the social context and the ideas of mead as well, for example. And they said, well, because of this, we need to kind of forget social psychology as it is. And we need to do, uh, we need to bring back these ideas and we need to integrate with sociology and we need to do qualitative research. It has to be the kind of research that can capture the workings of society. So we have to be asking people about what is their condition and allowing them to voice their own experiences. And we have to study ideological discourse and text because that's the only way you can catch the kind of justifications for why society is the way it is at play. So that was mind blowing to me. I was like, wow, okay, this is the kind of psychology I care about. These guys are at the forefront of thinking about psychology as a social science. And that's what you'd expect at the LSE, right? Um, typical lefty academics at the LSE and typical social scientists always thinking about integrating with these broader contexts. And to these guys, you know, biology was a bogeyman and even experiments were a bad thing. Certainly thinking about the brain was a bad thing. And I, I was really convinced by the enterprise and by a lot of the critique, but I wasn't quite convinced by the solution. Because the idea that the only way you can do a societal psychology, which is what they called it and what I still try to call what I do, is to do qualitative research in this very kind of critical tradition um, isn't necessarily the case. If the fault of the experimental method is that it's not adequately able to capture societal processes, are there ways that we can improve on the experimental method to try to bring some of these broader things into play? Or secondly, um, are there other quantitative methods that we can use to still capture these broader dynamics? And so I thought, why don't we go over to the States and see what's going on in this so-called nasty American social psychology? So I um, 
but I considered uh, PhD programs. I decided I was going to go do them in, in kind of the most mainstream place so that I could at least learn to speak the way they do and see what all the fuss was about. But I said, I'm only going to do a PhD in a kind of psychology that tries to look to wider society. So I applied to work with people like John Jost, thinking about system justification theory, and Daphna Oysterman, thinking about cultural psychology. But then I had a moment where I heard Jim Sedania speak at a conference, uh, ISPB conference in the summer. And the title of the talk was, um, yeah, The Psychology of Terror and Conflict and Violence, maybe something like that. And at the time, I was actually working um, for the British government in the Ministry of Defence. So of course I was going to go along to a talk on, um, on, on conflict and terror. Um, this is uh, what I did since the LSE. I went to the uh, Ministry of Defence as a social psychologist, just as an interesting aside, and I wanted to see how could social psychology be applied to understanding conflict resolution and um, engagement with populations in, um, in war zones, and also understanding some of the motives underlying terrorism. Um, and I had a great experience there. I'd be happy to ask some, uh, answer some questions about that. But ultimately, I found it lacking in terms of the extent to which we could look at the underlying mechanisms and what's really going on. You know, why do we behave the way we do, as opposed to just how can we intervene? So I go along to this talk with Jim Sedanius. I expect another talk about terrorism. And, you know, this is what's wrong with terrorists. And this is how odd they are. And they've got all these grievances and da, 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 da. And he got up and he just said, the kind of terror I'm going to talk about is state terrorism. <laughs> And then he went and laid forth social dominance theory. And social dominance theory is a theory of how oppression and hierarchy are maintained through forces at multiple levels, at the individual level, at the group level, at the ideological level, and at the institutional level. And he goes forth and presents uh, uh, reams of quantitative data documenting this. Documenting not just that there is, you know, lots of inequality in American society and that some social groups are systematically discriminated against, that there are a set of institutional processes that maintain that, that's the kind of thing a sociologist could show, but the psychological aspect of it, right? So why is it that, cert that certain institutions, let's think of the police in the US, end up behaving the way they do, end up consistently um, behaving in ways that seem to um, discriminate against and even inflict violence on low power groups in society? What is it about ideologies and myths and justifications that people give? And um, for example, this uh, advocacy of something like colorblindness um, or the American dream that allow us to continue to believe that society is fair and that society is kind of maybe unequal, but that's okay as long as you can get ahead in society. And um, why do those ideological tropes work and how do they operate to justify the social system? So that's thinking about ideology in a psychological way. And then, of course, at the individual level, um, the work that um, Jim Sedanius and Felicia Prado are most known for um, thinking, is thinking about individual preferences for or against inequality and hierarchy, and that's the construct of social dominance orientation. But I tried to think about that last. I wasn't really interested in social dominance orientation. That's another personality variable. Psychology does personality variables really well. But to be honest, you're, how much are you explaining if you just say the kind of people who do nasty things are nasty kind of people? I would rather know what kind of context can turn you or me to be nasty and what kind of context can make us unhappy and what is the impact of being subject to oppressive context and the impact of being an oppressor or being put in an oppressive position. And to me, the rest of the theory, not just SDO, but the rest of the theory was rich with these kind of resources. So I said, okay, I've got to work with this guy. <laughs> this is the one I've got to do the PhD with. You know, and I tried to charm him at lunch, but he's not really much of a networker and he wasn't really that convinced. Um, but anyway, I submitted my PhD application and did the GREs and I had no idea what I was doing. I had no connections. Happily ask, uh, answer questions about applying to US um, PhDs. And um, then one day he called me. One day he just said, Jennifer, I've seen your application. I'd like to have a chat. And then I gave him this spiel about psychology and society and politics. And I said, Jim, your book changed my life. You know, I bought their, I bought their book, the 1999 book, Social Dominance, which uh, Jim and Felicia are doing a, an update of, by the way. And I said, this changed my life. I have so many questions I'd like to answer through this perspective. Um, and he admitted me and I ended up going to Harvard. And this was kind of a dream position. You get plenty of funding when you go to do American PhD. So it really was kind of... Um, uh, something I couldn't turn down, despite the massive dislocation that it can uh, impose on your life uh, to move to the US for five years or more.
So then I went to the States and I was like, great. Um, this whole Jim's world, political psychology, embeddedness and wider social structures, this was exactly it. Because this was Jim's story. Jim was actually James Brown from the Bronx, who used to be beaten up by the police regularly and who flirted with membership of the Black Panthers. And um, because he didn't want to be drafted for the Vietnam War, Jim left uh, New York and took refuge and took exile in Sweden, which was offering refugee status to Americans at the time who were evading the Vietnam War draft. That's where he took on the name Sidanius. And then he realized, and then he kind of got a permanent academic position in Sweden, started developing his ideas for social dominance theory, but then realized, as I realized at some stage, you're not gonna have influence unless you can go over to the States and speak at the heart of power and be in, in where all of the attention in academic psychology is focused. So we went as a single dad, gave up his tenure, uh, tenured position and went and became a postdoc at a university of Texas at Austin. And then he kind of made, uh, climbed his way up, went to UCLA and eventually ends up, you know, as a chair professor at Harvard, you know, James Brown from the Bronx, still only on a green card because he had to give up his American citizenship. And talking about the kinds of things that psychologists would never talk about, talking about hierarchy and oppression, bringing in the work of Althusser and Gramsci and Marx, but doing so not just in this kind of polemical way um, that was very prominent in other social sciences, right? Not just in terms of social theory, but with quantitative data showing systematically how these things are happening and showing how our mind is built to be ready for this kind of oppression and hierarchy. And I kind of realized, well, when you have the data like that, people can't ignore you anymore. And um, since 1993, in the early 90s, he was showing this and nobody was talking about power and hierarchy in psychology back then. And the social psychologists at Harvard weren't the ones who wanted to hire him. It was the other psychologists at Harvard, the ones who really, the big thinkers who realized this is a big theory. So let's fast forward then to um, the, the, uh, the noughties and kind of the 21st century. Topics such as power, um, ideology, hierarchy, um, inequality are very commonplace in psychology. And in particular, they are studied through experimental methods. So quantitative methods and experimental methods are brought to bear on these kind of big questions in a way kind of validating what I felt was the case. So there are two ways in which um, I think it's possible to do that. And I'm gonna kind of use that as a segue into thinking about um, the two strands uh, of my research right now. So one of them is political psychology. Um, and this is uh, one area that I look at. I ended up working a lot within the social dominance theory tradition. Um, much to my chagrin against what I had planned, I ended up publishing a lot on social dominance orientation. And this is the trick. When you get an individual difference variable that really, really works, um, you can get quite tempted to just keep publishing on that. That's maybe a little tip. Be careful of that, because if that's not what you originally want to do or inspires you intellectually, you don't you want to kind of resist those temptations. Um, but um, where that's taken me is to try to say, well, OK, let's not just think about people who are high and low in SDO. Let's think about what's going on here. What does it mean to be um, supportive of inequality? This is what SDO, social dominance orientation, is an index of your support for inequality between social groups. So it's your agreement with items such as um, um, no one group should dominate society. Obviously, the reverse scoring of that item and um, some groups are inherently inferior to other groups. So it's this idea that some groups should be on top of society and some groups should be at the bottom. So, you know, it, surely it's not an explanation just to say that people who are high in SDO tend to, you know, be nasty, racist, support Trump. People who are low in SDO tend to, you know, join Amnesty International and so on. What's actually going on there? So one stream of my research now is trying to understand the origins of these very basic kind of upstream ideological preferences. This is work I do at Lotte Thompson, um, who is at the University of Oslo and who was also a lab mate of mine at, at Jim Sedanius's lab. And we're kind of part of the, the vanguard, a lot of the graduates of, of, of Jim's lab around that time who are trying to push forward theorizing on SDO. But what Lotte and I like to do is to think about SDO in terms of what kinds of core social relationships are people trying to implement with this? Not just are some people nasty and they just like oppression. Why is it that they're agreeing to these items? And what we think might be going on, and this is something that we put forward in, in a recent uh, paper in Current Opinion in Psychology, so it's very, very short, just 2,000 words, I recommend you have a look at it. Um, and this is in the special issue on socio-ecological psychology. What we think might be going on is that when people express political preferences, what they're doing is they're expressing their preference for the application of a core kind of social relationship that originates from an interpersonal context to the intergroup context. 
So they're saying that when we think, and, and in particular to the societal context. So when I ask the question, how should we relate to each other in society? Who should get what in society? What I do is I think, well, well, who, what kind of a collective are we? What kind of a relationship am I in with others in society? And the answer to that question um, just decides the kind of political preferences and the kind of policies that I think are fair and right for that society. So I'm just gonna unpack that a little bit because that's quite abstract. What do I mean by kinds of social relationships? Here we draw on relational models theory this is the work of Alan Fisk, the brother of Susan Fisk, the well-known social psychologist. Alan Fisk is an anthropologist um, and he has found through his anthropological work in multiple societies and all through, also through scanning the work of others that um, across multiple cultures there seem to be core sets of social relationships and um, four core kinds of ways of relating to others that everybody seems to be able to implement but that are implemented in different ways in different contexts. The first of those and the most basic is communal sharing or communality. Communal sharing is a relationship with others in which um, you both uh, have the same interests and have the same faith and you will help each other and give each other whatever you need. Communal sharing is what you have with your immediate family. It's a kind of thing where um, it's uh, characterized by bonding and closeness and nobody is counting who has what. Nobody's counting who took what even from the fridge in a family fridge, for example. Everybody gets what they need in a communal relationship and the ones who need more get more and the ones who have more give more. Just think of a parent giving, giving, giving um, to their child, for example. And uh, the thinking is that communal sharing relationships originate from these kind of familial relationships. The next um, most complex one is the notion of authority ranking. And that's the idea that, well, there, there, there is some form of hierarchy and some sense in which some people or some person should get more than another person. This originates from the ideas of, um, of authority, where one person is um, sort of teaching or having a leadership position over another, but we think it also applies to contexts of dominance, or certainly that it manifests in contexts of dominance. Um, so dominance relationships such as um, a police officer and a member of the public, um, or um, uh, the head of a household and a servant working for them, master and slave kind of relationship. The next um, more complex one is equality ranking. And that is the thinking that actually um, that the, um, this is more applied to peer context. So if you think of your colleagues or your classmates, for example, and this is a sense that everybody should get the same. We, should, we all should broadly contribute the same amount and we all should receive the same amount. And when you do something, then I should do something. So the idea of reciprocity and turn-taking um, all fit within this notion of equality matching. And one implication of equality matching is that we should have evolved the ability to be tracking what, um, both how much I'm contributing so that I don't have much more than others in any kind of uh, social partnership and how much others are, are, are giving so that um, they are not getting much more than me or not giving much more than me. So we should always be kind of tracking both advantageous um, inequity and disadvantageous inequity. And, and as you'll know from the work of Peter Blake and others and Katie McAuliffe, um, it does seem that there is this universal cross-cultural and very early emerging um, sensitivity to forms of inequity. Although, of course, disadvantageous inequity seems to really bother children more than advantageous inequity. It seems that we need to learn from the cultural context to be bothered by us getting more than others. And the last of these relationships, so we've got um, communal sharing, we've got um, authority ranking, equality matching, and the last of these is what's called market pricing. I mean, Fisk Allen talks about this mostly from the point of view of exchange relationships where you have... Um, you're using a currency in order to quantify what it is that somebody has contributed. Um, so it's basically the relationship we'd have, we would have with a merchant or someone in a shop, where it's not that I'm giving you a bag of rice and you're giving me a bag of equal weight of, um, of lentils, it's that I'm paying you in, in some third currency. The key thing that we think is important about market pricing is this notion of proportionality. So here what you're tracking is not just did somebody do something, how much precisely did they contribute? How much precisely do they get? So these are these four kinds of relationships that Fisk says um, we have evolved to recognize, but that the broader cultural context decides the implementation of in specific contexts, in specific relationships or interactions. But all of this is applied to the interpersonal context, right? So then the question is when societies get so complex that we need to think about relations between social groups and we need to think about, um, we need to apply these basic social cognitive understanding of relationships to how we relate to others in the broader societal context, 
what, what, what relational model are we using? And so what Lotte and I are arguing is that um, the kind of individual, different, individual differences we see in your preference for whether some groups should um, have more than other groups, it's okay to have inequality between groups, versus everybody should get the same, depends on whether you think us as a society should relate in terms of authority ranking, where some groups actually are better than other groups. Let's say, for example, British people should get access to the NHS before other groups, so societal resources should be um, distributed um, with preferential access for some groups versus um, whether you think that society should be, you know, citizens of equals where everyone should get the same. And the kind of more extreme examples in terms of thinking about uh, societal uh, resources of um, sameness would be thinking about universal basic income, for example. Everybody should get the exact same amount. Um, the, uh, a communal version of uh, thinking about um, applying into interpersonal relationships to the societal level would um, say that it doesn't matter what anyone contributes, everybody should get according to what they need and everyone should give according to their ability. Of course, that's the classic Marxist maxim and that would be the basis of uh, a lot of socialist ideas. And it is the basis of some welfare states as well, particularly in Scandinavian contexts. And the last then would be this notion of proportionality, right? Well, what about this notion of actually you should get from society precisely depending on what you contribute to society? Well, you see those kinds of attitudes around too. And um, in particular, when you think about social insurance models of welfare um, that I should get um, from, I should get a pension that's proportionate to the amount that I've directly contributed uh, to society down, you know, down to the precise degree. And so that's what we're arguing in this piece, is that if you want to understand why people have certain preferences about why we distribute resources the way we do, um, you need to think about what kind of relationships they're trying to implement at the societal level and how they think they should be implemented. And we think that those preferences are going to be the product of a number of factors. Some of them will be very individual and temperamental and even genetic. So we recently published a paper looking at the genetic underpinnings of um, social dominance orientation with a twin sample. And there is uh, overlapping genetic variance. There's, there's a, uh, a strong inherited component, but also of course it's going to interact with the societal context and any kind of inherited proclivity doesn't make sense except in interaction with people's experiences in their lives and the nature of the wider social system. So another thing we talk about is, for example, how your socialization, both through your parenting and your experiences in school, um, will shape the extent to which you start thinking about certain uh, social relationships as more or less appropriate than others. And that's a very understudied area that I'd encourage people to look at. Uh, that, you know, there's a lot of work on infant cognition and how infants do seem to be born with this understanding of notions of hierarchy and inequality and um, reciprocity. And that's what a lot of uh, Lochta's work on infants shows. And then I've done work on adolescents looking at um, egalitarian preferences, predicting things over time. But what happens in between? Big uh, research gap. And the other is, um, and then of course, when you go out into the world and the social groups you identify with and the socioeconomic status you end up with, the set of resources you end up with, that will absolutely condition your preferences. And, and that's known from social dominance theory. Richer groups, higher power groups have higher levels of SDO. But even if you are from a richer or high power group and you join a, a lower power group or you, or you lose your money, there will still be an aspect of your relative positioning in STO that is maintained because it's this interaction between um, the individual and, and societal experience. So this is classic, um, I'm just gonna admit that person, this is classic uh, person by situation interaction, of course, which we all know about. But I think that I would encourage people when we think about person by situation interaction, let's not just think about personality and these kind of immediate social experiences. Let's go even deeper when we think about person and be aware, uh, be willing to consider biological underpinnings and whether we have evolved relational strategies that actually might play out in terms of inherited differences, which is what we seem to be observing with SDO. But also when we think about the societal context, let's take society seriously and not just think about, oh, well, that's going to be shaped by, um, you know, the relationships I have uh, in school. No, it's also going to be shaped by your position in society and how your society is structured, right? So whether your society itself is egalitarian versus not and to what degree, whether your society advances um, different kinds of values relating to power distance, or in particular collectivism or individualism. And the, this work is emerging, this kind of multi-level modeling, cross-national analysis of differences in egalitarianism and in other political preferences. And in core inequity aversion, as I was mentioning, even children across cultures um, seem to have these common patterns in how they think about inequality between individuals.
So that's that work and where we're going with it now is that Lotte and I are and um, we're planning a big um, panel study that will be run in Denmark and uh, because of course if you want to do this kind of endeavor you need to think about big data sets you need to be willing to consider evolutionary underpinnings and biological underpinnings and you need to be thinking seriously about societal um, influences. So what we're doing is a, a panel study where we're going to um, follow um, 6,000 people um, over four waves. I think over that'll be, end up being around three or four years and uh, where we ask questions such as um, their um, um, par parenting experiences and childhood exposure and but also their relational preferences and what what how they feel about these different relational types. And then we actually track how they're doing in their lives. And the way we do that is by matching their data from our surveys with the data, the data, the vast reams of data available from the Danish registry. So the registries, what I mean by this is, is um, all the data that the government holds about you. And unlike in the UK where things are not that joined up, where for example, your NHS data is kept separately to your crime records and that's kept separately to your academic um, achievement. In Scandinavia, all of this is linked up. So I can actually get your survey responses and I can connect them to the books you took out from the library, whether you attempted suicide, whether you end up in prison or accused of a crime. And, you know, if I go through the right ethics protocols, your DNA from the blood sample that was taken when you were born. So this is kind of crazy stuff. And uh, I think there's lots of potential there and that, that's um, hopefully a project to watch um, over the next few years. We're also continuing this and um, doing a behavioral genetics analysis of um, preference for not just equality and hierarchy, but these broader relational preferences and to see what's going on the underpinnings there. And what we hope we're doing is kind of carrying forward the social dominance theory tradition, integrating it with, with uh, theories from other social sciences, such as anthropology, relational models theory, um, being brave about considering evolutionary underpinnings, which is what I was always inspired to see Jim do because I think he really shows how um, you can consider evolution um, without, just do it, without just doing so in a very conservative way that seems to naturalize or justify inequality. And um, as a lot of evolutionary psychology, a lot of pretty poor evolutionary psychology has done. But you can also consider societal context. I mean, the nice thing about social dominance theory is that it really makes people on the right wing mad because it talks about oppression and talks about Marx. But it also really makes people on the left wing mad because it talks about individual differences and it talks about biology. And when you've got someone who's really angering people on both sides, you know they must be onto something. Because if it feels too easy, like it fits with your ideological preferences, then beware of, of, of these kind of biases um, that might be uh, causing you to think it's a great theory because it fits with your preferences, for example. So um, I hope that we're kind of trying to realize some of this digging into biological underpinnings, but only doing so with this interactionist view in terms of gene bioenvironment interactions, in terms of looking at really seriously at the role of wider social systems and, and trying to think about psychology as a socio-ecological system in the way that Asa Uskel and Shige Oishi have talked about socio-ecological psychology and considering material conditions and political structures and how they also shape these individual preferences. So that's one side of my research, which is the political psychology side of it, trying to dig deeper into individual differences. I'll just take a breather because I know I tend to speak fast. And let you finish digesting that. The other area is, okay, well, that's one way of seeing how psychology and individual um, psychology and the mind leads us to the kind of societies we have, right? Because if we could understand why it is that people are um, arriving at certain political preferences and why political divides seem to replicate across generations, despite the fact that we're all becoming more liberal overall, why people vote for um, populist parties or seemingly crazy and authoritarian leaders, we need to think about how psychology feeds into uh, getting us the kind of societies that we get. But at the other side, the other side of my research, I try to look at but what is the impact of those societal conditions on our own experience and our own well-being and not just on our attitudes but on our decisions right and this um jumps off another aspect of social dominance theory where another controversial aspect of it where um jim and felicia claim that one of the ways in which inequality is maintained between social groups it's mostly maintained by um uh, specific efforts by high power groups to uh, oppress and exclude low power groups but it's also uh, maintained and it's harder to get rid of it because of behavioral asymmetries between high and low power groups because high power group members seem to be better at behaving in ways that help them get ahead and here i don't just mean helping each other but also making decisions such as investing in education and investing money in the long term and keeping up school attendance, even taking um, medication and accessing free uh, social services uh, to be more likely to do that um, than low power groups. 
And Jim and Felicia talk about, well, we don't know why, and um, maybe this is some kind of dynamics of repression, but we don't kind of know why, and it's kind of controversial to talk about it. But I was like, well, surely we could do better than this. And um, so what I came across when I was at Harvard was I also uh, took part in an interdisciplinary program um, at the Harvard Kennedy School on inequality and social policy. I was the first psychologist to do this because I was all riled up about psychology can save the world, as you can tell, and uh, that tends to be my spiel. And so what I did there was I came across this work in sociology that started looking at behavioral differences across socioeconomic groups, right? So in some, you know, um, in particular differences in financial decision making, as I was mentioning, but also health behaviors, for example, people being more likely to um, engage in unhealthy behaviors, and um, even where those unhealthy behaviors are costly, right? So one of the major reasons why um, there are differences in um, eating and in diet across the socioeconomic spectrum is because of the cost of healthy food and the fact that um, healthy food outlets are far less available in deprived neighborhoods. But there are also differences in, in, in drinking and smoking and, and you know, smoking cigarettes are costly. So if you are poor or low income, why would you spend the limited income you have on smoking? And this idea that, you know, oh, well, gosh, you know, surely aren't people to blame for this? And in sociology, nobody wanted to talk about that. Understandably, it completely turned me off. We should not be looking at a societal inequality and socioeconomic inequalities from the point of view of people's individual decisions. This is blaming them for putting them in that situation. And that is what ended up happening in sociology in the 1950s and 60s. There was this idea of a culture of poverty um, where people were passing on these deficient values that just kept them in these kind of ghetto situations in the US. And then when, um, um, and that was kind of racist at heart. And then when African-American sociologist, um, Bill Julius Wilson, who was also at Harvard, pushed back on this and he said, you know what? If we don't talk about decisions and behaviors, we are just leaving open a vacuum that is gonna be filled by conservative social critics. And it'll only be conservative social critics who are talking about decisions and behaviors. And this is what happens when think people like Oscar Lewis and um, Bill Moynihan um, started talking about this culture of poverty and these deficient values. And he said, what we need to talk about is a culture of poverty, but that is affected by the societal structures. That is a product of the structural condition in which people find themselves. We need to think about behavioral responses to structural conditions, to poverty, to oppression, to discrimination. And I thought that was inspiring. But then at the same time, I, I came across Elder Shafir and Sendhil Mayanathan, whose work you might now be familiar with, but this was, they were very early on in their work. And they were also willing to talk about decisions um, among uh, low income groups. What they said was, if we use the experimental method to try to simulate what it's like to be poor, even for middle income people, we can show you that you would behave the same way, right? So that if you play a game where you're poor versus rich, then you yourself will start borrowing too much money from future rents. You yourself will make these unwise financial investments. And not only that, if we make your financial concerns salient, you will actually perform worse on basic cognitive tasks and on measures of intelligence than if we hadn't done that, right? And that's the power of the experimental method. They take middle income people and they get them to feel poor for a minute and, and they replicate some of this kind of psychological signature or behavioral signature that had so long been decried as associated with low income groups. Here in the UK, by the way, you don't have this tradition of sociology talking about decisions and behaviors in low income groups. We have tabloid newspapers, we have Benefit Street, and uh, we have, you know, cultural products that are systematically um, peddling all of these myths about and um, the idea of idleness and laziness and, and whatever kind of deficient values and traits associated with low income groups. So even so, it's I think it's just as urgent. This idea that that vacuum will be filled by conservative social critics is, ju is just kind of as urgent here. So these guys come along and what they do is they open up a space for thinking about decisions in the context of poverty that doesn't blame poor people and that recognizes the impact of the social situation on them. And that was really impactful. There were two big science papers. They have a book called Scarcity. It's, it's even influenced the World Bank and then they think about poverty and it's still um, quite influential in these areas. And that really got me excited. And so where my own research, and this was my PhD research and research that's built on since then kind of came in on that was to um, add a couple of things. First of all, I was like, okay, but it's not just poverty that does that. It's not just scarcity, not having enough resources. As a social psychologist, surely we know that um, not just what you absolutely have, but how you relatively feel you have um, and feel you are in relation to others that matters. So your subjective status, your relative status in relation to others should matter too. And so I designed a set of experiments um, that uh, shifted people's subjective perceptions of where they sat in society. So take middle income people in the States, people really don't know where they sit in society. People aren't that aware of how an equal society is. Everyone thinks they're middle class. 
So you can shift their perception of where they sit. And the, the most kind of uh, crude way I've done this is to give people feedback, you know, collect their demographic information and then give them feedback on a ladder measure. Like literally you sit here in relation to others uh, around 30, you're more uh, rich than 30% of Americans versus 80% of Americans. So this is really kind of crude, like deception induced um, um, social psychological manipulations. I've done more subtle ones too, where people, you fill out an income form and um, that makes you seem like you're quite uh, wealthy versus less wealthy, depending on how high the income categories go, right? So if, if I present you a form where you always have to put your income at the bottom versus your income being at the top, you might feel relatively rich or poor. But I've also done things like um, budgeting games where people play a household budgeting task. You have to try to balance your household income and you do that either with lots of money or with little money and you just get this a bit more ecologically valid experience of what it's like to not have enough and also of course to realize that others have more than you. And what I found was um, first speaking to the Malin Appen and Shafir literature that we do see the same kind of cognitive deficits. Um, people were performing worse on cognitive tasks to the extent that they thought they were lower in society than others regardless of what they actually were and controlling for their actual income, right? So this is not that people can be, um, are cognitively deficient and that's why they got there in the first place. It's raising these status concerns, making these kinds of inequalities salient that seems to impair cognitive functioning. That was the first point. A second point was that it also lowers their sense of control of perceived control and measured in terms of personal control, locus of control, and um, some measures that are seen to be quite trait-like. I find that they actually do shift uh, in a state-based uh, aspect, in a situational context, in response to these perceptions about where we sit in society. And this addition of status is important because it opens things up, not only to thinking about relative standing as opposed to absolute standing, but to thinking about inequality more broadly, not just thinking about whether we need to reduce poverty. And it makes it relevant beyond those who are at the bottom of society all the way up. Because of course, if you've, if you've looked at the work of Wilkinson and Pickett and others, you see that inequality and the status anxiety that it induces happens all the way up, even among rich people. They start getting more and more anxious about others having more than them. So I think it makes some of these things uh, far more relevant. That uh, since then I've kind of been developing a model and a theory of thinking about this kind of psychological situation of socioeconomic strain that integrates notions of scarcity, notions of status, and also instability, the inability to predict what's going to happen. Because I think that all of these three conditions, they really have implications for the kinds of decisions and behaviors that you might be likely to make. So that's one way it's important. A second way that this is important is because, uh, sorry, a second uh, kind of addition that I tried to make to this field, and this is more recently since graduating from my PhD, I did a British Academy postdoc and then I cut that short to come work at the LSE, um, was to say, well, hang on a second, is this necessarily always deficient? Do we always see this cognitive impairment when um, making these aspects of socioeconomic strain salient? Um, is is this idea that I have a lower sense of control? Is that me having the wrong attitude and you just need to increase my self-efficacy, for example? And are the decisions and behaviors that people make in context of socioeconomic strain necessarily always suboptimal? We've, we've established that they're not irrational, right? We've established that they're not because of cognitive or intelligence deficits, because we've shown how the situation can cause people to behave like that. But there's still a presumption in the scarcity work and a lot of the psychology of poverty work that there's still, that there's still worse decisions in relation to others. And indeed, there's this whole literature that looks at the negative impact of socioeconomic adversity on the developing brain and developing cognitive skills. And when, but when you think about things in a socio-ecological way, and you start thinking about decisions and behaviors as responses to, to cues that you're getting for the kind of environment you're living in, I think what we can uncover is um, ways is the underlying logic or the underlying rationale for some decisions and behaviors that we see. What I mean is that if you are getting cues that you're low in power in relation to others or um, that you don't have enough resources, you can't predict what's happening, it's very rational for you to reappraise your sense of control and to actually you know, report not being able to control your life outcomes. And if you can't control your life outcomes or you can't predict what's going to happen, it's very rational for you not to um, uh, withhold on uh, current rewards for the sake of future rewards. It's very rational for you to spend your money now on things you need to spend it on as opposed to holding it off for some uncertain future or investing in education and um, when you don't know uh, how long you will live or what the, your job prospects will be. Or even to smoke now to give yourself immediate stress relief because of uh, helping you deal with the here and now um, um, as opposed to thinking about some long-term health uh, costs that will affect you only later in life when all the cues you're getting around you in an environment is that people don't live that long and that you have no idea what's going to happen to you in the future. 
So some of you might be aware of the work of Walter Michel, of course, the marshmallow task and this, this idea of willpower. And if you can delay gratification, if you can resist one marshmallow for the sake of two, then uh, you, you're more likely to kind of do better in life later in life. You might be aware of the, uh, the more recent work by Kid Palmieri and Aslan, I think, um, uh, a variation on that where they find that actually maybe some of the differences in so-called willpower are actually differences in your reading of the situation as to whether I can predict what's going on in this situation and whether it's whether the experimenter is reliable. So what they did was they also they got children to do these studies but then they also changed whether previously the experiment the, the experimenter the one who told them that these two marshmallows were coming up, whether that experimenter had also kept his promise on something else, had let them play with some colored pencils. If he had said that they could, and they could, great. The experimenter was reliable, my environment is predictable, I will hold off for the second marshmallow. But if they had broken that promise, if the child had been told, okay, you'll be able to play with these pencils, and then they're not able to play with them, none of the children wait for the second marshmallow either. And the argument here is that, about the relevance of this, is that a lot of the reasons why uh, children are not delaying gratification is because they may have learned from their environment that it's not adaptive to do so. That they're living in an ecological context where you can't predict the future, where they don't have control over it, and where it's not rational to hold off um, present goals for future gains. So this whole idea of present bias, whether it plays out in terms of financial decisions, investing in education or health behaviors, I think really needs to be embedded within the context in which people live. And in particular, thinking about the psychological cues that are triggered by that context, where I think scarcity and stability and low status are most important. I've summarized some of my latest thinking on that again in another current opinion in psychology piece. And I also have a book chapter on it. Um, there and, and I try to think about the implications of these socioecological cues for um, self-regulation, for whether you're privileging long-term over short-term goals, because of course I think it can be adaptive and rational to privilege short-term goals when you're under socioeconomic strain. Um, for control appraisals, as I've already discussed, whether you can control your life outcomes, and also for cognitive processes, right? So let's go back to the scarcity work and think, well, what about the cognitive processes? How is it ever adaptive to just perform worse cognitively? Well, what I think might be going on there is one of two things, and this is what my current ongoing research that I'm just conducting now is looking at, which is that from the one hand, um, uh, cognitive processes are getting reallocated to more pressing needs when you put somebody under socioeconomic strain. So let's just think about my studies. I give you feedback that you're low in status and you perform worse on things like the two back task, right? Measure working memory updating. If I then actually tell you that that two-back task is a way of helping you um, gain in socioeconomic status later in life, you actually don't perform worse in the low status condition. So I introduce a two-by-two two setup where previously it was high low status, this time it's high low status and high low relevance, right? Where the cognitive task is irrelevant or is not presented in a way that matters to addressing the status anxiety that you're experiencing in my low status condition, we see low status perform worse than high status. But if I present a cognitive task as a way of getting ahead in SES, a way of helping you address the status threat that I've just put you under, we don't see any performance differences among high-low SES groups. In fact, it looks like the low SES, the low subjective status group, um, are performing better. So this implies that what's ha what looks like a cognitive deficit can actually be your cognitive resources just being allocated to dealing with pressing threats. And, and not being bothered with this silly cognitive task you've given them, but that can be brought back online if the tasks are made relevant. And there's some implications there for how we should frame, for example, academic tasks for children in school. Secondly, I think what might be going on is that you're tuning your cognitive resources to focus on the stimuli that really matter for you right then. And um, so if you're hungry, for example, I did that one of the studies in my postdoc, if you're fasting for 12 hours and you have breakfast versus you don't, so you've got one hungry group and one sated group, Sure, you'll perform worse on some random cognitive task that someone gives you, and it's already been shown that you perform worse on cognitive tasks if you're hungry. But what if I change the cognitive task to involve food stimuli, something that really helps address your pressing need in that moment, then we find there are no performance decrements among the hungry group versus the sated group. In fact, it looks like they might be performing better. This is a paper I'm writing up just now. So again, um, the, what looks like a cognitive impairment is actually a tuning of your cognition to address the, what you, it is that you need in that moment, according to the ecological cues you're getting about scarcity, instability, and, and low status. Um, and so that's those kind of cognitive aspects of the model are another component of it. And I just wanted to flag there and give a shout out to research that's also uh, from another strain, which is really trying to do this pivot away from a deficit model of looking at cognition and socioeconomic status to um, what they call hidden talents. 
And what Bill and Frankenhaus and colleagues are doing is they're saying, I'm looking at this in adulthood, the impact in these experimental responses to a socioeconomic strain. They're looking at the impact in childhood. So maybe people who've grown up under adversity and socioeconomic strain, maybe they perform worse on cognitive tasks that aren't adaptive to dealing with these kind of unstable environments. But if we start tapping uh, cognitive skills that would be adaptive in these environments, not something like inhibitory control, because it doesn't make sense for you to inhibit and to hold off for the sake of a future goal when you grow up in an unstable environment, but something like cognitive flexibility and shifting, the shifting task in executive functions, and then you actually find better performance among those who grow up in adversity, especially if you remind them of the instability in which they grew up. So this idea of hidden talents, and this, there's this broader push toward thinking about resilience and adaptiveness of so-called deficient or suboptimal decisions and behaviors, even though uh, associated with low-income groups, even though those decisions and behaviors might be some piece in the puzzle for why um, inequality is so hard to budge. So again, bringing us back to this notion of social dominance theory and, um, and trying to understand societal inequality and the impact and the under psychological impact and underpinnings of these broader social systems. I think I should be, uh, be quiet now because we only have eight minutes for questions. And um, so I'll leave it there. Um, I'm not sure how you want to do questions, if you want to do any. Yeah. Yes, so basically I just wanted to ask if anyone has any questions, um, they're welcome to just like unmute and ask or they can type in um, in the chat and like I can read them out. Um, so we can do it both ways. Um, but to start with some of the really, you talked about a lot of really, really interesting things to be fair. So um, I was just trying to um, kind of link some of those things to some of the current topics. So especially when you're talking about um, social dominance or inequality between groups and intergroup relations. I was kind of thinking of how that kind of relates to pr police brutality and the entire BAME movement that is going now in the, on in the States. And if you could, through your research, actually recommend some solutions that you might think would kind of help. I know it's very abstract and very hard, but a lot of people have been having a go at it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I forgot about that, how to save the world through all of this in, in the last few minutes. I mean, what I have been doing on Twitter is really trying to push for the relevance of social dominance theory to understanding issues of systemic racism. I think the key insight you get from it is that um, systemic racism is not caused by individual racism. And if you fix it through whatever social psychology interventions, if you try to address implicit bias, if you try to address unconscious racism or try to get individuals who are less racist to join the police, you're not really going to fix the issue. What a social dominance theory perspective would say is that these individual preferences are a manifestation of, well, first of these underlying preferences for implementing social relationships in different ways, but also that interacts with a system that arrays power and resources in a particular way. And it's the inequality in power and resources between social groups that creates the kind of scenario where a police, the job of a police force, the implied job of police force becomes one of keeping people who don't have resources away from the people who do have resources and protecting the property of those who do um, and keeping troublesome groups out of mainstream society. And, and Jim said very early on from the 1990s that, um, that police forces are systemically what he calls hierarchy enhancing. Um, as a result of that, and what he's tracked, what he's, and how he's found that play out is that, for example, the people higher in SDO are more likely to join the police. The higher you are in SDO, the better you will do in the police. That in LA County police, for example, the more uh, violent uh, police brutality complaints people had against uh, police officers, the better that officer did. And, and thinking there is that you're not deviating if you're engaging in brutality against African Americans, you're doing precisely what the police force is meant to do. Right? Not explicitly meant to do, but implicitly, that's what it's meant to do. And Loïc Vacan and other um, critiques, even from Bourdieu, of how society functions and the role of societal institutions would speak to that. And if that's the case, it, we're not going to reform it by fixing individual attitudes. We're only going to reform it by addressing the structural inequalities. And um, so that's kind of one, not that easy, but kind of one uh, quick um, impl implication of that. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Um, probably reform change, policy change, that sort of thing. Um, so I can see that Wafi has his hand up, raised his hand, so go ahead. Yes, hello, how are you? Good morning. Hi, Wafi. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Shelley, for the precise and so informative presentation. Uh, I'm Wafi from South Sudan. Okay, I have uh, a question regarding the 
racism and like I'm not asking for you to be a what a society is that uh, respectful. Uh, for me in Sudan, you know, we have multi like race people who have blacks, we have Arabs, you have people they just call themselves whatever they want. But from my own experience, uh, of course we have racism in Sudan, but the, and I have spent a lot of time in Turkey, almost four years. But the racism that I face in my own country is more even than the, uh, such the injustice and harassment that I face it in Turkey. Uh, I have I need your comment in that, Doctor. Please, what is it from? In Sudan, we all the same nation, but the racism is more higher than what I face in Turkey. Thank you. So you're saying the racism you faced in Sudan is greater than the racism faced in in the UK? Yes, exactly. In Turkey, Turkey. not UK, Turkey. In Turkey. In Turkey. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I think that if you want to look at the the, the way in which uh, intergroup discrimination and prejudice is going to play out in a society, you need to look at the distribution of power and resources, and you got to think what is the key indicator of how power and resources are distributed. Sometimes that's race, and sometimes that's not. And um, so in somewhere like um, Cuba, for example, I visited there, it's not actually about skin color. And so I, I remember, I could barely even remember what skin tone people had when I was in Cuba, because it wasn't an indicator of how much power and resources ha people had. Whereas of course, it's a major way of doing social categorization in the US and the UK, because it is an indicator of how much power and resources someone has. So then you shift to other contexts and you think, well, what, what's the classic indicator? Um, I imagine in North African context that the divide between Arabs and Black Africans is a big one in terms of power and resources, where, um, correct me if I'm wrong, where um, people with Arab background do have more power and resources and always have them. Whereas in Turkey, the divide isn't so much there. I mean, the big divide in Turkey is between Islamists and secularists or in, in terms of social class, but it's less ethnic. Um, and so uh, outsider groups, to the extent that they're not actively um, associated with a low power position in a pre-existing hierarchy in a new country will be less oppressed. Let's think about this, for example, um, from the point of view of Indian uh, people from Indian origin, right? So I have an, an Indian friend who said to me, when he came to the UK, he experienced much more racism than when he went to the US. Why is that? Because in the UK, there is a history, there's a colonial history associated with India, and there is an actual history of Indian migrants coming in who are generally from working class background, generally doing low quality work and seen to be in a low position in society since the 1950s, since partition in India. Whereas in the US, the history of Indian Americans is of actually being kind of highly educated and doing quite well and advancing as, as compared, to other, compared to other groups. So it matters what the history of that group is in that society and how much power and resources they'd be given access to. The extent to which it's gonna act, people's coalitional psychology mechanisms are gonna attach onto race. Um, and they will only attach onto race where that is an indicator of, of historical inequalities. And so it's less so the case maybe with um, uh, black Africans in Turkey because that's, there's not such a history there of colonialism or of uh, immigration. Um, so that might be a bit pessimistic, but um, when we were talking now about basically intergroup bias uh, or intergroup racism, is it, um, which might also be an abstract question, is it inevitable to have racism in some sort of way in society? Um, so basically not, if it's not about class, not about race, it's going to be something else, basically. <laughs> so, so not inevitably racism, yes, inevitably some form of group-based discrimination, unless you can ma maintain some kind of utopia. Social dominance theory is very pessimistic in terms of that. It says that even if you get a low power group to invert the, the hierarchy and become dominant, it then itself will instigate domination and inequality against other groups. I don't think that's always the case. I'm running experiments with Nork Tiley where we're literally creating revolutions in the lab. We run hundreds and hundreds of groups all arrayed in hierarchies where we have a revolution and everything. And then we see, does the previously low power group oppress the previous high power group? And it depends who gets into power. That's the answer to that. And it, so it might be that those high in SDO or authoritarians are the ones who quickly get to the top of the revolutionary group. But, um, but in terms of what this coalitional psychology perspective would say, which it draws on social dominance theory, but also the work of Tubi and Cosmides, they would say that we're not born to be racist, we're born to be coalitional psychologists. And so what we come into an environment and we figure out, okay, what are the dynamics of competition and cooperation, which I usually use uh, as a, for which I usually use as a heuristic, who's got what power and resources. 
And if you shift those dynamics, if you distribute the power and resources differently, or if you um, try to get people to cooperate in mixed race groups, for example, as opposed to in um, same race groups, then actually some of these basic social categorization mechanisms shift. And so there's a famous paper, Can Race Be Erased? by Kurzban, Tubi, and Cosmides, published in PNAS around 2004, where, the, where they found exactly that, that these basic social cognitive mechanisms that seem to be part of our innate racism shifted once you shifted the dynamics of cooperation and competition. And that's very hopeful because it means that in a multi-ethnic society, as long as we can have the right indicators of cooperation um, and make sure that these dynamics of inequality don't play out again, maybe we can at least see beyond race. But, but will we see beyond coalitions? Probably not. So we always need to be aware of coalitions. I mean, social identity theory taught us that years ago. Um, so Lena just sent, uh, thank you very much about the very interesting talk. Could you please repeat the name of the book and author about social dominance? Sure, it's called Social Dominance, an Intergroup Theory of Hierarchy and Oppression. <laughs> um, and it's by Jim Sedanius and Felicia Prato. So I think it's one of the best books in the social sciences. People rarely read the book though, they usually read the articles and then you just hear about SDO this and SDO that. But the book is great. And as I said, Jim and Felicia are doing an update on it as well, but that probably won't be out for the next year or two. Um, if it's okay with you, would you be able to um, email me just a list of the resources, your opinion paper as well? I would love to read that and then I can forward it on to uh, all the attendees. Great. Will do. Okay, I can see we're out of time. Thank yes, you so, so much. On that note, um, thank you so much for the interesting talk and we really enjoyed it. Have a lovely day. Sure. Take care. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.